There's a lot of really bad podcast hosts out there. I think the greatest thing that I did was I went from the least interesting person in the room to the most interested person in the room. I can't tell you how many blue check marks follow me because I've had great conversations with them and they go, wow, he's a really good dude. I want to stay in touch. Society said because my mom was an addict, I should have been an addict. Society says because my dad ended up in jail, I should have ended up in jail. But the reality is that's my outside circumstance. What matters is the choices I make to create the life for me. Probably why one of my favorite quotes to this day is, life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to what happens to you. Things are going to change around you no matter what you do, but that part doesn't matter. What matters is how you react to the change. On today's episode, I talk about how to level up your network, start a movement, and build a huge community with Justin Shank. So you are the host of Growth Now Movement, a number one podcast in America with over 2 million downloads. <laughs> crazy. You've had in-depth conversations with guests like Gabby Bernstein, Ed Milet, Nicole Lappin, Dean Graziosi, and hundreds more. You've been named a top eight podcaster to watch by Inc.com and have been named an icon of influence, which is pretty cool. But your podcast and the entire movement you've led started as a way to overcome your setbacks, childhood health issues, a mother addicted to opioids, a dad that went to prison. Thinking back to your teenage years, what was that time like for you? I always say that I was really, really fortunate that, you know, my parents had their own demons, but I was really fortunate because they loved me unconditionally. And I never felt like I was alone or different or a nuisance or any of these things that I think a lot of kids who went through that may have felt at, at, at any given time. So my parents were really, really good at communicating that with me. But one thing that it really did do was it made me desire deep conversations at a young age, probably why I became a podcaster, right? Like I remember always, I, I always used to say I was the only 14 year old who would prefer hanging out with the 40 year olds and talking with them than hanging out with other 14 year olds. And so not being able to go out and run and play and do the sports, it it gave me the opportunity to sit back and, and kind of observe humans in a different way. Uh, and I became very, very curious and very, very self-aware um, because a lot of the, those years, I couldn't do much by myself. I ended up breaking both my hips, but broke my hip. So <laughs> okay, I didn't know that. How did you break your hip? <laughs> yeah. So I was actually, we didn't know this at the time, but I was born with a growth plate deficiency in my hips. Um, the, the fancy medical term is gro uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Say that five times fast, right? No. Nope. And so I just had weak growth plates. And one day I was out skateboarding and I went off of a ramp. Like I said, I was a super active kid, went off of a ramp. The skateboard slipped. I slipped. And apparently even before I hit the ground, my hip shattered into five pieces. And then I hit the ground and, and I was outside by myself. It was actually August 12th. Uh, I know this just because the day that day will stick in your head. And I literally had to drag myself at 12 years old to the curb so I wouldn't get hit by a car. Because so I was by myself in the middle of the street, at, you know, just in case a car was going to come. I had to drag myself in, in massive pain to the side of the road. Uh, Hold on. And do, that you, do you, do you, you this is like this is burned into your memory? Like you remember oh, yeah. this moment? Yeah. Now I lived in a fancy neighborhood. All the windows were closed. Everybody had their air conditioning humming. Nobody heard me. And somebody about a quarter mile down the road who was cutting their grass heard me screaming and called my mom. Uh, and they and my mom ran out and, you know, called the ambulance and they came and got me. And I became very, very self-aware of what's my role in everything right now. Right. You know, and that was a, a, age 12 was the beginning of my mom's opioid addiction as well. And so we didn't know it was was it going to be a long term addiction. She ended up going to rehab. And I remember going to like Alateen as a kid, learning how to you know adapt with a parent who, who has an addiction issue and stuff like that. Um, but again, I think I think more than anything, my parents loving me unconditionally made it seem kind of normal at the time. Like it, it wasn't like I was any different than anybody else. And in a very, very strange way, um, they handled that portion very, very well. If you know Justin, you know him because of his podcast, because of the Growth Now Movement live events, because he contributes to books. And viewers, we're going to get into all of that and more. We're going to cover off the lessons he's learned starting his podcast, how to be an amazing host, how to build a huge community. But before we do, I was super curious and I'm sure you're curious as well. What happened in the black hole of his life between 18, 19 years old and suddenly emerging at 30 as this huge podcaster? 
it's a big black hole, man. And it's it's funny, like you look back at time of your life and I think that time feels like it was a billion years ago and it also feels like it was yesterday. I ended up getting a direct sales job and I fell in love with the, uh, this idea that I can have control over my money, I can have control over my life and I, somebody else isn't dictating who I'm going to be, where I'm going to be, when I'm going to be, all those things. Uh, sales, um, the ultimate, the ultimate place for those was, who can talk, who don't want anyone to control them and they want to make some money. <laughs> That's right, man. And at 18 years old, when I got this job, I was like, this is this is it. And I thought it was the coolest thing. But when I was 19 was the pivotal moment for me, really. Uh, my mentor at the time, who also worked for Vector Marketing, handed me a book and it was Who Moved My Cheese? And that ha! book... Yeah. That is an old one, man. <laughs> it's so good, though. I actually just gave it to my my girlfriend's son to read, which was like a okay, cool moment so for, for me. For, those, for people who aren't, I would say... 50 and above, because it's actually rare for people your age and my age to know this. So for people who aren't 50 and above, what the heck is Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, essentially it's a book. I mean, they have all these crazy characters, two little people and two mics that live in a maze. But but the premise of the story is things are going to change around you no matter what you do. But that part doesn't matter. What matters is how you react to the change. And so that's what, probably why one of my favorite quotes to this day is life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to what happens to you. And I realized that that book spoke to me at the core because of the things that I went through, right? Society said, because my mom was an addict, I should have been an addict. Society says, because my dad ended up in jail, I should have ended up in jail. Um, but the reality is that's my outside circumstance. What matters is the choices I make to create the life for me. And, you know, that was at 19 years old, this aha moment of like, wow, there's these books. You, that you got that? You got that from that book? 100%. How did you connect those dots? Uh, because... Whenever I read anything, unless I, if I can't put myself in the book, I can't read it. So like any Harry Potter books or anything, I can't do it. I can't picture myself in the wizardly world of Harry Potter. So I, I can't relate to it. And so when I was reading this book, I pictured myself as one of those characters in this maze and realizing that life took things from me. It took things from me. I had to change high schools after my sophomore year of high school. I couldn't play sports anymore. All these things changed. So life did that. I didn't do that. Um, but what I realized was, and I wasn't in the place where I thought I would be at 18, 19 years old. I thought I'd be in college, right? Like as a 12, 13, 14 year old, that's what your path is. And so I go, well, how do I, how do I make it better? How do I make, take these things and, and utilize them to become better? And that was my realization when I read this book at 19 years old. And obviously it was a long road from there, 19, 20, 21. And then t not till 30 did I figure out what it was that I needed to, to create the life that I wanted. So 19, you figure out, hey, it's, it's, not so much, it's not so much what life throws at me. It's my opportunity to react to the way that, that these circumstances come. And, that, and that's, I mean, that is a remarkable breakthrough for someone that's so young. Um, yeah. Now I, I mean, will say I, this. I feel, like I, I feel like I only learned that last year. <laughs> the, the realization wasn't that clear. Like it wasn't okay. like, oh, well, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It matters how I react to it. But it was the understanding of like, this is the premise of this story. Like things are going yeah. to happen and I, it's up to me to make them better. What were you searching for, chasing for? What did you want in your 20s? Because because that obviously changed with the podcast. That obviously changed, you know, a few months before you launched your podcast, your mother passed. And so there was this big, big change at the age of 30. But what was it that you wanted and were in pursuit of during your 20s? You know, it's interesting. I was chasing what society said was success, which again, as especially as a male in this world, uh, it's the house, the car, you know, the the woman, that said, people go, wow, she's really attractive, right? All those things. And that's what I was chasing in my 20s. Um, when I look at all that stuff, I, I go, I realize I have it now, but it wasn't, that was never the pursuit. The pursuit was fulfillment for me. You know, you, you had mentioned earlier, my mom passed away six months before I launched the show. And I looked at that as my pivotal moment in my life because I realized that my mom didn't die because she was an addict. My mom died because she didn't love herself. And I ended up going on a three month bender where I got blackout drunk six nights a week just so I could sleep and I didn't feel the pain and do all these things. And I had a, a coach at the time and she called me randomly one day and she goes, hey, what are you doing tonight? And I go, I'm going out with some buddies. And she goes, no, you're not. And she goes, you're going to sit down and you're going to feel this. You're going to sit in your feelings and you're going to feel it. And so I didn't go out and I sat in, in my feelings and I allowed myself to not numb my, my emotions out. And it was one of the hardest nights of my life because it was painful. Uh, but I woke up the next day and I had this great weight lifted off of my shoulder. And that was the, that was actually the moment where I went, okay, my mom died because she didn't love herself. And then I stopped and I went, wait, we've got a problem here. Cause I don't love myself either. 
And so this thus began this journey of the podcast of me picking the brains of these individuals going at your rock bottom moment. How did you love yourself? Like if you listen to the first six months of the podcast, I, I asked almost every single guest, what's your definition of self love and how do you find it? Because I was searching for this whole in, this this thing, right? And so it was a great eye opening experience for me to realize that I need to love myself first before any of these other amazing things can come into my life. It became a journey, and I still to this day invite people to come along with me on the journey when they come when it comes to my podcast because I think that we're never done, right? There's no end to this whole thing, right? You can have great goals and you can attain them, but once you attain them, then what? Then you're just going to set the next goal and go after them. And so I'm on a journey now, and and uh, you know. Five and a half years ago, when it really began for me, it was a different journey than it is now. I just happened to have success along the way because I poured my heart and soul into it and I did the work and I did all those things that made me uncomfortable. Uh, and so I grew as a person and grew as a business and grew as a man and grew as a, a significant other to people and a friend to others. And so it became this amazing opportunity for me to pick the brains of what I felt was successful uh, and really figure out what what made people tick and how do I implement that into my life to create the life that fulfills me at every single moment, every single level. What, what are the little um, indicators for you that, that a conversation is hitting a level that, that you want it to? So I always have an end point in mind. Um, and I don't know if we talked about this when, when we connected, uh, because I just recently had this conversation, but I always have an end point in mind, right? I, I know where I want the conversation to go. I know what I want to get out of the, the guest, so I look at myself as the director of the conversation. So I'm an empath, so I can feel people's energy. I know when they're feeling something and when they're not. And I know kind of how to adjust that conversation to get them to the point that they're comfortable. Now, I won't hit record with anybody uh, until we're comfortable. Oh, by the way, some of the greatest lessons I ever learned was if you want to make somebody feel comfortable with sharing with you, share with them, right? So sharing them a little bit, telling them a little bit about my story and kind of why I do the podcast and why I've, I've had the success. They go, oh, wow, that's really cool. It's really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Well, guess what happens? The second I ask that question that might be a little uncomfortable, they're like, yeah, sure, I'm willing to share and I'm willing to go there. I mean, Ed Milet cried on my show. And so when we have those types of conversations, it means I was able to make him open up before I even hit record. Uh, and then once I hit record, it was just, you know, a continued conversation from where we were before. And so for me, I know where I want it to go. If I don't get it there, which happens from time to time, um, but if I don't get it there, I'm a little disappointed, uh, but I know where I want it to go. And once I get there, I go, yes, that's exactly what I need. There's this feeling inside of like, that's the one sentence that the world needs to hear. Uh, and, and so th then I feel like it's a win every single time after that. That's such good advice because um, often I think people think that they can just show up and kind of see where it goes. And um, and, and I bounce back and forth. I mean, I, I feel like I do a tremendous amount of research on the people who, who I'm bringing on. Part of it is a sign of respect because I want them to know that I know them and their story quite well. And the other part of it is is I never know where the conversation is going to go. I, I have I have a theme or a topic in mind, but but more than anything, I just want to see where we can take it. And, and so, I, but I was I was curious if if you know if if there's like a tingle up your back, or if there's goosebumps, or if you're just like oh, you're hearing the sound bites in real time, and you're like this this is the this is the magic. This is this is the dance that we're going for. Yeah, you know, I used to get goosebumps. Um, and I, I'm not saying that podcasting has lost its luster. Like I love every conversation I have. I had a fascinating conversation last week. I still love it, but I almost, for lack of a better term, I almost expect it. So I, I now have guests that come on my show that know my show. Like they already know the final question I ask. They already know what, what I expect from them. So they're willing already to open up. You know, I, I feel like the, the thing that I've mastered the most is being a podcast host. If I had to guess, like if somebody said, what, you, what, do you, what have you mastered in your life? I would say probably podcast hosting, like getting the right information out of somebody. And so it's almost like an expectation. Break, break that down for me, though. So there's a lot of really bad podcast hosts out there. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so but I've said this on, on the stage at PodFest before, by the way. But there's a lot of really bad podcast hosts out there. And I feel like I've mastered the art of conversation that has meaning attached. So the goosebumps and the tingles aren't quite there anymore. I still get them by the way, when afterwards, like they keep me on zoom, 
like not only like I always keep them on for a little bit, but if they just keep talking and they keep me on Zoom, I get the goosebumps then because these are people that I admire. And then all of a sudden they want to be my friend and they ask me questions and they stay in touch with me and they do all these things. Right. Like the people that follow. I only have like I've just shy of six thousand followers on Instagram. Right. Um, but the people who follow me are, are ridiculous, like Burt Kreischer. Like how, I can't tell you how many blue check marks follow me because I've had great conversations with them and they go, wow, he's a really good dude. I want to stay in touch. Is it not strange that, I mean, it's, it's a skill for sure. It's a skill. It's a gift. It's a talent. It, I think people tend to, um, undervalue or even underplay how much time and effort goes into crafting that. But is it not strange how listening and directing a great conversation and putting something together that that shows the person across from you that you really care about honoring them or their story or their lessons how it kind of just shoots you straight like like I had James Altucher on the podcast we were talking about skip the line it skips the line but doing it well still gets you to a place where you can form better relationships than you know than any other I mean you, you can't walk up to these people at a conference and expect to have that type of connection yeah yeah. I, you know, I think the greatest thing that I did was I went from the least interesting person in the room to the most interested person in the room. I truly care about that person and their journey and the things that they've done in the world, which is why I don't, I don't accept 99.99% of the pitches on my show. Cause if I don't care, it's not going to allow me to be the best at what I do. And so I have to care about the person that comes on the show. I have to have some sort of desire to either have a conversation with them or there's somebody I know and I admire and I trust and I've built a relationship with and I've had conversation with. I say that because there's a lot of people that want to have conversations with people to serve them, not to serve the person they're having the conversation with. And so I end every conversation the same way with anybody I talk to. And it's very, very genuine. And it's who I am as a person. And I say, if there, if there's anything I can help you out with, please let me know. And it's a genuine offer. It could be anything. Just let me know. And if I can help you, I will. And if I can't, maybe I know somebody who, who can. And if not, sorry, but hey, I asked. And most people don't take me up on the offer. Um, and I think the realization of that power versus it just being a subconscious thing that I did, it was actually a story with Ed Milet. We ended up chatting for the first time on the phone. This is before he was on the show. There was, all, there was a whole mix up and his internet wasn't working. He's like, hey, just call me. And he gave me his phone number. And so, of course, I was nervous because I like, I like video chat because I, and I hate talking on the phone because I can't see body language and all that stuff. So I'm talking to this guy that I admire on the phone and we have a great chat. And I finished the conversation with, hey, if there's anything I can help you with in the meantime, please let me know. I'm ha- more than happy to help. And there was just silence on the other side of the phone. And I was like, oh, no, did he hang up? Like, what's going on? And also he goes, hey, sorry. He goes, nobody ever asks me that. Wow. You know, he goes, you know, like me and, and some of my friends, like he and he mentioned like Grant Cardone and these other people. He's like, people always want things from us. And he's, he's like, we purposely just call each other and tell each other that we love each other because we don't get it enough because people always want from us. He goes, so it's I didn't mean to ignore that question. I just didn't know how to respond. And so I, I go, you know what? I've got a couple of things that might help you out. And I introduced him to, to a couple of people that have been on his show because um, I was like, you guys, you guys would have a great conversation. And so it was a win, win, win. Right. I, I stayed. I now stay connected with Ed. We still text. And it was really from the heart of like, hey, I want to help. And then that led to us having a great conversation on the podcast. I hope listeners, viewers, you know, if you're if you're if you're sticking with us, it's because it's because you're interested in this, obviously, right? I, I'm a content producer. So if you're not here, you're not listening. But if you are here, you're interested. And what, what Justin just said is like the largest benefit of doing anything, of doing anything in business, of doing any kind of collaboration, of doing any type of connection. You know, I, I can recall, um, it was like a Friday evening last summer and my phone rings with this really strange area code. I never pick up my phone. Like, like my mom can call me. I won't pick up the phone. I'm the same way, by the way. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like 20 after six or something. I'm, I'm up in my bedroom. I just had a shower from a run. I'm like getting ready to make dinner for the kids or something. And the phone rings. And I'm, I don't know why, but I pick up the, I, I pick up the phone. And on the other line, it's like, hello, this is Les Brown. Oof. And I'm like, oh, Les. Like, and we, we kind of been, I've been working with this team a bit. I, oh, Les, how, how can I help you? And then we just have this like half an hour conversation and I'm like, but it was because we were trying to, I was trying to help his team with something. And I guess someone on his team said, you you better call Mark because you know, it's just, you need to figure this out. Uh, And it was one of those moments where I hung up the phone and I went downstairs. My wife was like, where have you been? We got, I was like, 
I, I, I just spent half an hour talking to Les, <laughs> you know, and That's and then awesome. and then you know a few weeks later I'm in New York helping them with a conference and we're doing some other stuff and it's like it was just one of those moments. It's it's strange. It's it's strange that that those types of things can happen so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it, uh, it, it is a, it is amazing when those moments can happen and, and you kind of let yourself pour into it. A lot of people would have tripped over themselves as they answered that phone and, and they wouldn't have been able to have a 30 minute conversation. But you talk about not answering your phone. This is a fun fact about me. So I don't ever answer my phone. Actually, as a matter of fact, if my father calls me, I'll answer once in a blue moon. He goes, oh, I just figured I'd, uh, you know, hear from you via text later. And so my <laughs> outgoing voicemail says, hey, if we didn't have a scheduled time to talk, uh, I don't answer the phone. Also, don't leave a voicemail because I don't listen to my voicemail. You obviously have my number. Text me and let me know what you want to talk about. And we'll find a time to chat. And it makes me seem like such a but it was me taking back my time because I had these friends that would call me and I'd feel bad for not answering. So then I would answer and I'd talk to them for an hour. And I don't, I don't have yeah. time for that. Uh, not that yeah. I'm important. I needed to take back my time and that's how I do it. I had a buddy call me 10 minutes before I had to hop on with you and I actually answered because I knew I could end it. So you got, right, you're you like, got I, 10 I, I got to go. I got yeah. <laughs> a, a few hacks. Don't answer the phone before something happens. Don't check your email before something important because if something's going to upset you, it's going to throw you off. Yep. And, and I learned that stuff from my friend Evan Carmichael because uh, that man, uh, I mean, he has a cell phone, but he doesn't even know he has a cell phone number. <laughs> I, I have, I'm lucky enough to have his cell phone numbers, yeah. but, um, but when I met him, uh, I met him in 2007, um, he, he did not have a phone for his business. It was so bad that if he had to make an outgoing call, he had to take, he had to pick up a telephone and like plug it into the wall to make an outbound call because he, he's like, there, there was no way to get in touch with him. There was no way to get a hold of him. There, wow. there was no way for any of that stuff. <laughs> So I, I want to keep going. I want to keep going with this idea of community building, though, because anything that we create requires uh, a following. I mean, we're not. It's nice to create stuff for yourself, right? Most of our passions will start from from a desire to 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 do it for us. I think that's a great place to start, but it's only human <laughs> to want to make sure that the stuff you're putting out there is driving value. You know, if you didn't get that email from the man in Japan or the person in Japan who said, thank you so much for this conversation because it changed the direction of my life. Um, if you don't get some kind of positive feedback, if you don't get something, then it's like you're, you're just throwing stuff out into a vacuum and it feels very hollow. So at what point did doing the podcast turn into more of community building and and was that based off of like hey i need to monetize this thing hey i'm gonna go to f you know uh you know funnel hackers hey i'm gonna i'm gonna turn into an entrepreneur or was it more <laughs> out of a place of service so i still haven't been to funnel hackers um i <laughs> nothing against I, them i have lots of friends who go down there in september i still but. haven't signed up for click funnels i still haven't um, and it was, it was more for me. It was from a place of service. I, when I realized that the pod, so again, I went into podcasting, not understanding podcasting, not understanding online business, not understanding how to build a course, not understanding any of that stuff. But when you talk about building community, it was really more of coming from a place of service. And I realized as the show started to grow, I go, wait, I have something here. But as you know, in the world of podcasting, even if you're doing 10,000 downloads an episode, sometimes you don't even know who these people are. Like there's people listening to me from a hundred countries all every single week. And I go, well, I don't know 99% of them. And I was like, well, why don't I, why don't I start to create a community? And so I was like, I'm just going to do a live event and see who shows up. And so I put together this live event. I made it very affordable. Early bird tickets were $97, you know, the typical online price. Cause that's what my coach said to price it at. So I was like, cool, 97 bucks and let's make it affordable and, and build a community from that standpoint. And people showed up from 16 States in Canada to my first event. And I was like, well, that's kind of crazy. I guess I'm doing, <laughs> I guess I'm doing something right, but I still didn't understand business, but that was my realization of like, I have a, a community that I can serve now. I physically saw them in a room and I was like, wow, these people came from everywhere. They cheer. It was the loudest I had ever heard a room when I came out onto the stage. I was like, this is absolutely insane. And I didn't have anything for them. And there wasn't an offer. There wasn't a, Hey, join me here. It wasn't any of those things. And so my plan in 2020 was to develop that. And then COVID happened. Um, but I realized that I could do virtual things. And so we did two amazing virtual events during COVID, but, but it's there now. Uh, and then actually I'm doing another live event 20 May of 2022, uh, in which on the back end there will be a community offer to say, Hey, if you really want to engage in this community, it's like going to be a whopping 47 bucks a month, uh, come and do it. And we're not doing it in a Facebook group. We're going to do 
it in a circle or something. I'm, we're, we're looking at different options. Discord. Discord That's is an option moving. too. Yeah. But you know what it is? My, my 11 year old bonus son is on discord all the time. And so I feel weird building a <laughs> online community <laughs> on discord, like in the middle of our business conversations, let's talk about Minecraft. No, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. But Bill Yu's, Bill Yu's building up on Discord and everyone's building up on Discord. Yeah, so. I do like Bill Yu a lot. When Justin talks about walking onto stage and being kind of hit with a wall of cheering people, people who are there to see him, I know that in his mind, he must have thought, who am I? Who am I to have all these people show up? Who am I to have people cheering at me? I'm just some average guy. And I don't mean this as a negative, because actually Justin and I joked a little bit about this off camera. There's nothing special about Justin. Nothing. The only thing that's a little special about him is that he actually did it. And I had this moment of realization myself. Last September, I'm sitting in Tampa at an event being held by my buddy, Matt Andrews. And I'm watching Matt up on stage. I'm watching people in the audience watch him with admiration, marvel at what he's put together, watching him hang out with Vanilla Ice, who's the keynote, do all these cool things. And it hits me that the only difference between Matt on stage, between Justin on stage, and those of us sitting in the audience is that they did it. They had the idea. They took on the risk. And then... They just went out and made it happen. They built a house and then invited people into their home. And by doing so, they get to be the one who's celebrated. They get to be the one who's on stage. They're not sitting in the audience hoping one day to do it. And, and so I pose this to Justin because to me, it feels like a huge gap. And yet there's nothing more magical about it. It's literally just show up and make it happen. And you're exactly right. The only difference is I, I took the action, right? So I've always said that I don't want to be a person where somebody says, I want to be like Justin. I want people to look at me and go, I want, or I should say, I want, I want to be the catalyst for the conversation of the growth. So, hey, I, I sparked a conversation in you that said, okay, I can do it. And so I love the idea that somebody looks at me and go, well, if that schmuck can do it. I can do it too. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I've been in the first 10 episodes of people's podcasts as guests. And I always say yes, by the way, but been in the first 10 episodes of podcasts because somebody said, Hey, I saw that you had a podcast and I really liked what you did. And so I decided I want to start a podcast too. Uh, would you be on my show? A hundred percent. You like, got, you got to reframe that though, because, because I think you see it as like, Hey, if that schmuck can do it, I could do it too. No, you're, you're already, you're already f so far along that, that people will say, um, you know, well, you had you, you you know the timing was right. You were super early. Um, I, I don't think most people go if they can do it, I can do it. They just put people on a pedestal and assume that they can't do it. Yeah, no, you're right, and and and, and I see that too when they interview me. They're they're nervous. Like they literally tell me they're nervous, and I'm like, well, okay. Uh, but by the end of the conversation, we're we're buddies. You know what I mean? Like it's like I like it, that's just who I am. I think what I'm learning now, if you want to talk about like what growth am I going through now in the past couple of months is I'm learning the balance of being humble and also understanding of what I've built. And the understanding mm -hmm. of what I built isn't something that I realized until a couple months ago. Um, I think I, I, I knew it, but I always, I just kind of downplayed it. And I was just like, Oh no, you know, uh, I'm lucky and blah, blah, blah. But no, I'm really good at a lot of things. And because I'm really good at a lot of things, and I took the chance and I put the pieces together. I've been able to build this thing and I'm really, I'm really grateful for it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm still humbled at the fact that people invite me to speak at their things and people invite me to speak on their podcasts. And I, and I'm humbled by that. Uh, and I think that humbleness will always be there, uh, because of, because of what I went through. And the understanding that like I could end up there again. And I think when we get too arrogant and we get too cocky and we do all these things, we can end up there very, very quickly. Uh, and so I think remembering where I came from and being humble with the fact that people want to be in my space now where there's so many people that I want to be in their space. Uh, but also understanding like that happened because I've, I've done the work. And so there's that balance. Dude, six months ago, if we had this conversation, I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to say, I think I've, I, I believe that I've mastered the art of podcasting or podcast hosting. Like I wouldn't have been able to say that six months ago. That's been the internal work for me to go, no, it's okay to, to, to pat yourself on the back and, and say, you know, you're doing a really good job, man. Just keep going. Uh, and so yeah. that's, that's really the work that I'm, I'm in right now. 
um, is the understanding of that. And I also can't wait to hear people cheer again at my event in May of 2022 because that was the greatest freaking feeling in the world. <laughs> it's it's awesome. I love live events. I mean, hybrid events are great, but live events are where it's at, you know? And so I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think that that's a, a really good place to be. When you can do something and get to the point where you can actually take a step back and say, no, you know what? With, with respect, um, I am awesome at all these things. I need to grow in all of these other areas. That actually leads to, to what my friend Evan has kind of told me that I need to get better at, which is this idea of, of a humble confidence. When you can be so confident in who you are and what you do and what you bring that you come in incredibly humble that's the next level. And it seems to me like you're saying that you've hit that kind of level. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's still moments of working through it, but I've gotten a million times better. And that's, and that's the world I live in of like looking back at my life six months ago and, and go, what have I improved on? What haven't I improved on? How do I get back on track here? And, you know, let's, let's acknowledge the things that I have gotten better at where I, I didn't do that before. Right. Like I'm a big believer in find the master, follow the model. Um, I was very much following the Lewis house model. I think it's all perspective. Right. Like people look at us at five and a half years ago. Oh, you're early to the game. I look at those guys and go, well, you were early to the game. But then they look at those old radio disc jockeys who started a podcast because they had the equipment, you know, 20 years ago. And they go, wow, no, they were early to the game. So it's really all about matter perspective and understanding how the world works. And guess what? At some point, when somebody starts a podcast today, five years from now, somebody's going to go, wow, you were early to the game. Because podcasting isn't going away anytime soon. And it's just the reality. I just hope that I'm not like those ra old radio disc jockeys 20 years from now. <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> well, so so I, I've, I've been thinking all along, you know, like, um, one, how do you not get bored? How, how do you keep things fresh? What's next for you? And how do you push yourself there without, at this point, allowing fear or doubt to kind of creep in? Yeah, man, I, I think there's two things, right? The obvious one is the continued growth of my live events. I think doing, doing live events and, and you know, this, you've helped so many people do their own. Um, it is a scary gamble. It's a scary, scary gamble. Like, and, and you kind of go, wow, like I'm going to, I'm going to shout about this thing for six months and I hope people buy tickets and got, yeah, what am I going to do if they don't? Cause then I can't even sell sponsorships if nobody's there and you play that crazy game. Um, and so for me, I think the scary thing with the live event space is that, um, I want to fill an arena one day and me saying that out loud is scary because I know many, many people who have, I've met them at events and like, Hey, I've heard about your podcast. I can't wait till you fill that arena. I can't blah, blah, blah. Um, and so it's out there. Right. And I think it's scary to go put yourself out there in any way, shape or form to say, okay, now here's what I'm working on. But I think more now than anything, I want to be more and more transparent about my beliefs uh, and my approach to things. My next challenge and my next fear is to be a hundred percent unapologetically myself Instead of playing, I don't want to say playing the role because I've always been the person who's been like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but more of like, well, I understand more of the, the Rogan-esque guy to go, well, no, I see what you're saying, but let me push back here a little bit. Instead of going with the flow, of, instead, of, instead of doing all that stuff. And so what you're going to see on the podcast go, in, in the next couple of weeks are people who uh, tend to be very outspoken and are willing to put themselves out there. And the, what's the fear of that? Because that's my next real fear is... Is that best for you or best for the audience? Best for me. Um, okay. It's best for me because... Well, so I love that you asked that question because now I, I have to pause and reframe. It's best for me in, in my own well-being going forward because I think sometimes when we're not 100% honest with ourselves and honest with, uh, uh, you know, we have audiences, right? And honest with our audience, I think that it can uh, create stress and anxiety and all these things. So from that standpoint, it's better for me. It's better for my audience because they can decide if they want to continue to follow me or not. It's also better for a long-term audience because I'll build more of my people versus the curated people. So it's best for both, but I'm doing it for me uh, because there's a level of, oh, is it okay if I type this on social media? Is it okay if I say this out there in the world? Is it okay for me to take my sometimes ridiculous humor humor, and put it into the things that I'm doing? Uh, but I think the next scary thing is, man, I'm, I'm jumping into full force of like who I am and what my beliefs are. Uh, and you can come along for the ride or you can't. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deject anybody who feels differently. I embrace every single person just like I always have. It's just about me speaking up more to, to help my stress and anxiety.
So what would you say, you know, if I were if I were to ask you, we're talking about community, we're talking about connection, we're talking about being great podcast hosts. What what's the thing you got to focus on most? Being really really curious. Period. Curious in your guest, curious about your audience, curious about uh, life, curious about how to be better, curious about every single thing. Ask questions. I think people are afraid to ask questions these days. And so if we're able to ask the right questions and be super curious about the things happening in the world, that's when growth happens. That's when community happens. That's when being a good podcast host happens. You know, I I used to be the kid in school who was afraid to raise his hand and ask a question because I was afraid somebody was going to judge me. And that's probably part of the reason why I sucked in school. But I now make a living asking questions. And so I, I'm a really big believer in being curious and asking the right question. I think that's I think that's the secret to a lot of life. <laughs>